I can't do it. She's got to do it. Tanuja. Okay. Okay. It's recording. All right. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Why don't you come sit over here so you can see my screen? If you want to see my screen, you can sit here and here. There you go. I'll get it connected there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm going to show you. Uh, you don't need to see my face. I want you to see my slide presentation. So I'm going to switch the screen to uh, my slide presentation. And uh, we're uh, talking about, uh, can you see my screen now? No. No. So I have to share the screen somehow. Uh, you have this green share. Share screen, yeah. Yes, share okay. screen. Yeah. Um, After bookmark. Yeah. Hello. Unmute your uh, mute mute yourself. There, can you see the screen? Can you see my presentation? Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. okay. So I'm talking about the non nonlinear syntax, insights from Indian linguistic traditions for developing language neutral syntactic representation. Now uh, we'll cover a number of topics and I'll try to do it you know, quickly within half an hour. First of all, a little bit about the history of modern linguistics and how they have used phrase structure and dependency trees, but usually only to represent speech forms. And this focus on speech forms is due to the pressure of, uh, in the early 20th century, for linguistics to make itself a hard science. So under the pressure of, of empiricism, they focused entirely on, on the manifest versions of language that is in speech and writing and neglected the parts of it which are not uh, amenable to the senses, the meaning. Whereas the Indian tradition starts with meaning, it makes meaning primary. And this is a significant difference from the modern uh, approach. And uh, we'll talk about how that has some advantages. So first, let's, uh, uh, let's see, I'm gonna make this, get this out of the way, it's blocking my screen. Okay. Um, so uh, Condillac, a, a French uh, philosopher, recognized that thought is complex and that it uh, that it can it can be expressed in different languages in different ways and therefore the words do not have a direct correlation with the meaning in, in the sense that the, the words themselves don't uh, uh, innately embody uh, the meaning um, that because it can be expressed in different ways in different languages. So, uh, so then uh, in the early 20th century, Leonard Bloomfield, who's considered to be the founder of American linguistics, uh, said that the statement of meanings is therefore the weak point in language study because again, under the pressure of uh, empiricism, it, it uh, uh, can't, it's not open to being observed. Linguistic study must always start from the phonetic form and not from the meaning. Zelig Harris, who's, who started uh, some, uh, he was the, one of the teachers of Chomsky and started the formal linguistics 
is that the main research of descriptive linguistics and the only relation which will be accepted as relevant in the present survey is the distribution or arrangement within the flow of speech of some parts or features relative to others. And this is the modern study of syntax, which focuses solely on word order. Now, Skinner, who's uh, the founder of behaviorism, or really went, not the founder, but he brought it to its height, let's say in the 60s, he advocated the study of behavior, including the use of language, in terms of conditioned responses by reference only to the functional relationships of organisms in their environments without reference to mental structures. In other words, he looks only at the input and the output that can be observed and puts everything else in a black box. Chomsky reacted sharply to this focus on, on observables in a review of Skinner's verbal behavior in 1967. He said this framework of behaviorism and of empiricism in general was largely mythology. Its widespread acceptance was not the result of empirical support, persuasive reasoning, or the absence of a plausible alternative. In other words, it's a uh, it's a belief system. It's a belief system, uh, just as many people recognize, many religions have certain belief systems. Well, the behaviorist outlook or the materialist uh, outlook of the 20th century is also largely based on belief. Chomsky uh, asserted that there was some universal human innate faculty of language that accounts for some of the linguistic knowledge that's inexplicable by, inexplicable by experience. In other words, the model advocated by Skinner could not adequately, adequately explain the language behavior just by looking at the inputs and the outputs. And he, uh, Chomsky considered that this uh, language faculty is an intrinsic part of human biology. There's a certain yeah. faculty of of language, that generative grammar was a system of knowledge in the mind of the speaker. So he's talking about mental structures here. And language acquisition, he said, was a transition between mental states. He recognized that grammar could be separated from the lexicon, and this separation we'll come back to in a moment. So Chomsky accounted for sentences by generating, from, uh, generating them from a basic abstract linear structure by phrase structure and transformation rules. Transformational grammar is the first form of this. It's a more naive form than, than later and more recently uh, he's worked out, but uh, some of the uh, residue of the assumptions of uh, of transformational grammar remain. So uh, in phrase structure grammar, one analyzes sentences by progressively dividing phrases into their immediate constituents until atomic lexical units are re reached. Initially, one divides them into two, a subject phrase and a predicate. And, uh, and this, is, this is something that accords with traditional predicate logic in the West, and it also accords with uh, the Nyayakas procedure in, in India. And then one usually analyzes further by subjecting the parts to uh, division into binary branches. Rules account for altered word orders, as well as the hierarchical structure of components in the sentence. Okay, despite the fact that Chomsky turned attention to internal mental considerations, there are two factors in his program that kept linguistic science in the bondage of materialism. One is this strict separation of syntax from semantics, and the other is that he posited a linearly ordered initial state in sentence generation. So he considered the active, the fundamental, and the transformational grammar transformed that into the passive. So, uh, so one linearly ordered arrangement of words is considered fundam a fundamental representation of the thought. Um, 
So this separation of syntax from semantics uh, freed the formal properties of syntax from empirical factors associated with conventions in particular languages at particular times and places. And Chomsky thought he could come up with some uni universals of, of language that were uh, uh, purely formal. And he also separated syntax from uh, how humans view the world or, or their worldview. Many people who are deeply involved in the cultural study of linguistics uh, think that languages have a great deal to do with how humans conceptualize their world. And so it shouldn't be entirely separated. Now, as I mentioned, the uh, linearly ordered initial sentence state means that uh, transformational uh, grammar assumes that one order is basic relative to the other orders, and it writes rules to transform that one order into the others. So, the, um, so Chomsky, Chomsky's um, formalism left uh, linguistics over the last 60 years, really, uh, separated from uh, the study of languages and philology. And, uh, and linguist, linguists often engage in detailed formal analysis without knowing any language very deeply. And that's a, that's a drawback. Uh, so he deprived linguistics of useful insights that arrive from deep, deep familiarity with other modes of thought that philology and the study of foreign languages engender. Now, uh, as opposed to Chomsky, and right around the same time, uh, Lucien Tenier, a French linguist, uh, distinguished structural order from linear order and recognize that hierarchical structure precedes linear order in a speaker's consciousness. The act of speaking then transforms that hierarchical order into a linear sequence. The listener converts the linear sequence and express language into the structural order for their understanding. So Tenier's point of view in this, uh, what's called the dependency analysis recognizes that the, the structure belongs to the consciousness, not to the actual language. Now he considered the verb the most important constituent of a clause, rather than considering the sentence divided into a subject and predicate and considering the uh, subject the most important as Western logic had it. Uh, <laughs> Somebody's hearing some sirens in the background. Um, okay, so the, so uh, we'll come we'll come back to some parallels in Indian thought with this division. But uh, the act, considering the verb or the action uh, as most principal coincides with the viewpoints of Sanskrit Vyakarana and Mansa. So the agent, the direct object, and indirect object are arguments of the verb, according to Tenier, and, uh, and have particularly valency, valency properties that are associated with verbs. And then additional adjuncts are, are left free. Uh, the verb stands at the top node of a dependency tree, and various nodes descend from it. So uh, in, now in cognitive linguistics, meaning is the central issue. Cognitive linguists generally uh, dissociate themselves both from the empiricist approach and from the formal linguistic approach of Chomsky. Uh, now, um, talking about the history of 20th century linguistics, uh, Toneva Mathewson writes uh, in the Encyclopedia of Life Support Systems, Life Support Systems, that Positivist materialistic empiricism considered meaning to be inherently subjective, directly unobservable, and thus beyond the scope of scientific investigation. Behaviorism studied human behavior, including language, in terms of habits, stimuli, and responses, and neglected meaning entirely. Okay. 
Chomsky reacted against positivism and behaviorism, intending to bring mind back into the scope of investigation, but it turned out to be a formal systems approach in which the rules of syntax are independent of semantics. So he's still separating off a large uh, segment of meaning or consciousness from uh, linguistic study. And a lot of cognitive linguistics has to do with uh, biological re research, that is, that is neuroscience of the brain, uh, and still uh, stays away from introspection, but, uh, but still it leaves room for understanding human linguistic conception uh, from a broad array of avenues. And that includes, since we can't interview ancient native speakers of Sanskrit, uh, we still uh, have a lot of usefulness for the ancient linguists and uh, philosophers of language in the Sanskrit tradition who describe in minute detail the various cognitions that are associated with various linguistic structures. Now, uh, let's look a little bit about uh, Look, look at these uh, structural trees and you'll see why it is that the binary phrase structure tree as shown here is inadequate for languages like Sanskrit where there's a lot freer word order. So here's a, the main node is the sentence and it's divided into the subject phrase and the object phrase, the, the verb phrase. And uh, uh, analyzes into subject and predicate, and then each phrase itself is, is uh, binarily divided underneath that. The dependency tree puts the verb at the top and makes the agent subordinate to it, as well as making the other phrases in the sentence subordinate to it, and it makes the head of the phrase the node rather than the phrase itself. In, if we apply this to Sanskrit, uh, in, in Sanskrit, udhyane is not a, a prepositional phrase, it's a single word. In the garden, Devadatta sits in the garden, and you see the uh, independency structure, the verb siddhatis for sits will be at the top. But if we have a very complex sentence that uses many participants in the action, uh, refers to many participants in the action, such as this, Devadatta brings uh, uh, a pot with a cart in the city for Yagyadatta from his house. Uh, now, all of the participants in the action are, are equally subordinate to the verb representing the action. And if we rearrange those, that word order, they're all still subordinate to that action. In other words, changing the word order has nothing to do with changing the hierarchical structure. And this is, this is an advantage. It's, it would be totally artificial to divide this sentence into phrases if we did so like this, okay, in, the, in phrase structure analysis. Devadatta here is separated off from the rest of the verb phrase. But these units, grahat, yamidataya, and so on, are not, they don't form natural units here. This is totally arbitrary. And all of these verb phrase nodes are also then totally arbitrary. They don't represent anything real in the cognition of this sentence. So, uh, since we're getting on in time, I'll, uh, I think I summarized that well enough. Um, so in, in phrase structure, the sequence of speech forms is paramount. And in transformational grammar, you, you transform one sequence, which is taken as fundamental into another. Whereas in, um, in the uh, dependency analysis, the hierarch hierarchical structure precedes the linear order in the speaker's consciousness, and this is separate from the ordering. The branches of the tree are free to change, and this is much better in capturing the structure of uh, free word order languages. 
Now, as I mentioned, the motivation of linguists to focus on speech is, is due to empiricism because, uh, uh, because those are things you can see and they wanted to prove themselves as a science. So they uh, were eager to represent things uh, in terms which are visible and therefore the uh, trees of Chomsky and Tentier both uh, focus on the words not the meanings. Now, naive materialism considers bodies multiple and discrete. Pe people are, are, are tied to their bodies. You can't know another person's thoughts directly. Uh, cognition of the meaning of speech is limited to the content of the speech. There's no direct communication through consciousness, according to linguists. All the relevant content is in the linguistic transcription. And so corpus linguistics can discover how language works solely by statistical research on linguistic transcription. Now, in my opinion, it's a, one fact of having, as I learned from having taught historical linguistics, is that it's obvious that subsequent generations do not understand everything about the language that the previous generation understood. Because if they did, language wouldn't change. The fact of language change itself is evidence that, that the human beings are not able to reconstruct the entire thought or cognition, co consciousness of the speakers just from what is available to them in the uh, spoken or written uh, language. Now, uh, the philosophy of, let's come to the philosophy of science, uh, the assumption that Language cognition depends only upon what is captured in linguistic transcriptions is without basis. Now, uh, you know, first of all, we know a lot is communicated by background knowledge uh, in a culture and by gestures and facial expressions and so on. All of this contributes. So, so saying that it's all, all the information is communicated just by the words is not necessarily true. This is a, a great assumption. And anybody who writes understands that you have to communicate a lot of detail in writing that's not necessarily to communicate when you're face to face with your speaker, because other things can be communicated by all kinds of other aspects of language, like uh, uh, increase and decrease in volume and so on. Okay, but in any case, uh, this whole uh, approach of focusing on the uh, making the assumptions of empiricism determine linguistic science is mistaken because in the most advanced sciences that is in, in physics and in particular quantum mechanics uh, it's recognized that uh, materialist reductionism is incompatible with the most successful interpretations of quantum mechanics now, um, I'll uh, skip to my brother, uh, David Scharf, who wrote his dissertation on this in particular. He said, the Schrodinger equation theoretically determines the precise state of a system at any time. However, uh, to measure the state requires use of a measurement device. Therefore, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics includes reference to a macroscopic entity, the measuring device. Because it refers to a macroscopic entity, it does not achieve a microscopic ex explanation of entities. Therefore, quantum mechanics is incompatible with the reductionist program. That means you can't reduce all of the understanding of consciousness to what is uh, uh, to biological uh, interactions in the brain. You can't reduce all biological interactions in the brain to chemistry. You can't reduce all chemistry to uh, physical, physics interactions and particles. Um, and uh, all physics interactions and particles uh, can't, all, can't necessarily all be explained in terms of uh, fields because, because even quantum mechanics can't explain all of the macroscopic entities in terms of, of fields. It has to resort to macroscopic entities in its explanation. 
So that means it's resorting to the whole. The whole is determined by a conception on the part of the observer. I'll skip this. These are other examples here I'm showing of, of how uh, successful analysis uh, was often helped by background knowledge um, over and above what was available from the linguistic structure. And uh, now Hume, who's the uh, most extreme empiricist in the modern Western philosophical tradition, was dissatisfied with his ability to explain how one could have cognition of objects um, if everything was presented to observers in terms of independent impressions. And he was, he was, he was saying if every representation were completely foreign to every other, standing apart in isolation, no such thing as knowledge would ever arise. For knowledge is essentially a whole in which represent, representations stand compared and connected. Uh, Kant reacted specifically to Hume's inability to explain these holes and recognized that since we do in fact have knowledge, therefore there is some structure in us, in human co cognition, in, in the human faculty of knowledge, which integrates all knowledge. And he called that factor the uh, transcendental unity of apperception. He said, there can be in us no items of knowledge, no connection or unity of one item of knowledge with another without that unity of consciousness, which precedes all data of intuitions and by relation to which representation of objects is alone possible. This pure, original, unchangeable consciousness, I shall name transcendental apperception. So, uh, so although speech is linear and can be represented in a line, thought occurs in consciousness and is multidimensional. And it's in thought where the complex relations of, of what we call language really take place. It's not in the speech forms and therefore the practices of modern linguists to represent linguistic structure in, in uh, trees of speech forms is misleading because they don't have the structure. The speech forms don't have the structure. It's the consciousness that has the structure. So one has to look into the structure of consciousness and cognition, and then one can project that structure of consciousness onto the speech forms in the same way that projective geometry can project complex structures in multiple, multiple dimensions onto fewer dimensions. So uh, that's the approach we want to take in, and that's the approach taken in, in Paninian grammar. Paninian grammar begins with semantic conditions and it introduces speech forms to capture various aspects of those uh, semantic conditions, that is of the meanings, the meanings that is of, of cognitive structures and um, thoughts. And then additional rules uh, go through the process of uh, fine tuning the language of Sanskrit. All traditional grammatic systems in India use the same approach from starting with meanings and going towards speech forms. Now, various, uh, I'll skip these various forms of, of uh, words in the Indian tradition. Um, what I wanna get to in particular before our time runs out is that, that yes, there are differences in the way that uh, thought structures are represented. The Nyayakas take up an approach which is very familiar to the subject predicate approach of the West. And this is partly due to the Nyayakas uh, being theists. They believed in, in God as the primary mover and, um, and they uh, separated the predicate from it. Whereas the Mimansakas considered the action as primary since they were focusing on ritual as the principal activity. The grammarians more or less correspond with the Nyayakas in this sense. Uh, but I'm gonna go directly now to uh, 
I just want to say that the various uh, uh, a, con contributing factors of language were all worked out in detail by the uh, tradition of grammar associating different cognitions with different uh, speech forms. And this is an example of how uh, the modern cognitive linguists, particularly Count de Butta, who I'm here to work on, I'm working on translating his his uh, which is a summary of the conclusions of the grammarians in associating the particular cogn cognitive structures with particular speech forms. This is a, a use of that uh, cognitive structure. Uh, a, a f this is a phrase that constructs the cognitive structure for this simple sentence. It is the activity favorable to cooking that has David Dutta as its agent and rice as its object. This is very simple in terms of words. However, uh, it actually gets much more uh, subtle than this uh, because it's the, it's the objects of, the, not the words. It's the, so I'm putting the, the cognitions, the thoughts in the square boxes here. Paka is the cooking. Devadatta is Devadatta, not the word Devadatta. And Odana is the rice. Um, and it's the, it's the rice and the person of Devadatta that have the relation with the action of cooking. It is not the words that are related to each other. So, uh, but these word represented trees don't accurately capture all of the structure that the Indian grammarians worked out. So this is a representation of the complex structure worked out by the Indian grammarians where you have, so um, Kandabhatta recognizes Vyapara or the activity of the agent uh, as the principal, uh, the principal element in the cognition. And what's called the result of that activity, in this case cooking, is the softening of the rice. And that softening of the rice is located in the rice. Okay, it's, roast, it's located in the, uh, in the uh, substrate where that softening takes place, and which happens to be rice. And rice has a number of properties. It has the generic property of being rice. It has masculine gender and it has singular number. Okay, these are the properties considered to be associated with rice. Uh, and uh, the activity itself is located in the agent, which is no different from the individual Devadatta. And Devadatta has masculine gender and singular number located in him. And the time, the present time, is also located in that act activity. And each of the speech forms that represent these, these are the morphemes are associated with these different structures. So the root putch is associated with the activity and with the softening uh, that is the result of that activity. And here the softening has this relation, these, these square boxes again are re representing exactly the same structure I showed in the previous slide. And this ovals are representing the speech form. So the root has those meanings, has two meanings, you see. And the verbal termination denotes the uh, present time as well as the agent and singular number. So it has multiple uh, meanings. And the, uh, the stem forming affix shup here, this uh, is is co-signifying agency. So it's a complex graphical structure. And uh, it's not a one-to-one -one association between a word and a co a co an element in the cognitive structure. So if we, if we, we can accurately map this out for what the uh, cognitive linguists have, have done. And uh, that is Kaundabhatta and, and others in the modern Indian linguistic science. So I aim, this is a, this is a, uh, diagram for the passive sentence, and there are slight differences from the active sentence, but the cognitive structure is exactly the same. And here, the, the difference is that the passive verbal termination denotes still singularity, but it denotes the, uh, the uh, 
substrate of the softening that is the direct object rather than the, rather than the agent. So these, these differences are all captured in the um, structures of the, of, the, of the modern Indian cognitive scientists. And, uh, and we, I hope to, uh, in this year, produce a translation of Kandabhatta's work, which will familiarize me in detail with all of his mappings of cognitive structures to verbal elements. And I intend to use this in uh, making a, uh, a formal, uh, I've, I've made a, a formalization of Panini's grammar, whereby we can associate in detail all of the cognitive structures of each word and each morpheme with the production of the whole speech form of that word and make it make a dictionary of Panini that will be uh, that will be a detailed mapping of the cognitive structures uh, in Sanskrit. So let me stop there and ask if you have some questions and we can I hope I don't know if we have time we have it's just been 40 minutes from when I joined the session. So let's see if we have time. Okay, your timer is set for 40 minutes. Anybody still here? We are here. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Let's see. Um, Peter, if nobody is asking, I would like to have a small question. Uh, if, if you can hear me. I can hear you. Um, first of all, it was a very complex presentation but your slides made it a little more um, a little more accessible so thank you for this um, now um, I would like to ask you because um, what, what is the difference between um, I mean do Buddhists also uh, then would be related to the materialist theory of perception, like as you said. I'm sorry, say that again, I blocked you out for a moment. No, I can't hear anymore what happened. I can't hear anymore. Oh, okay, now I can hear. Um, uh, it's Sharma masters who actually, you know, that way the Kant's um, uh, idea of uh, transcendental uh, unity of a perception. So how is it uh, different from, uh, if you may tell me, uh, with this Buddhist theory of uh, perception, which is a sequential stream of different perceptions. So is it also located in a, a basic uh, consciousness or is it like the consciousness is also broken there? I'm, I'm sorry if you could. But, yeah, this is a very interesting question. You know, there's a, um, many uh, philosophers consider that the, this Buddhist idea of a stream of of cognitions is very similar to what Hume was trying to work out. And there's a book called, uh, I think it's called uh, Hume and the Buddhists, something like that, <laughs> which you might be interested in looking at. But this would not be something that Kant would agree with at all. Okay, so the Buddhists think that one moment of consciousness gives rise to the next moment of consciousness and disappears. And, uh, and like that, there's a, a sequence, and there is no real unity. But uh, this contrasts sharply with, uh, you know, the Vedanta point of view in India, which considers that there's this, a single, whole, uh, unified 
absolute, which is of the nature of consciousness. That is, you know, Sat Chit Ananda, uh, uh, reality, consciousness, bliss is the fundamental nature of reality. So that's that's a fundamental contrast. Now Kant, he differs somewhat from this point of view, uh, from the Vedanta point of view, uh, because he he doesn't admit that we can have any knowledge of the absolute. Uh, and actually the, the Vedantic tradition would agree if we characterize that knowledge as, um, as knowledge in the form of a subject related to an object through a means of knowing. Because the knowledge of the absolute is impossible in that in that way and the only way that one can have knowledge of the absolute is by being the absolute <laughs> and you 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 know more or less feel that nature you don't know it as an object you can't know it as, as an object so in my opinion the buddhists uh, understanding was dealing with knowledge in this relative terms that is in terms of the, the knower, the known, and the, and the uh, relation between them. And in that structure, they, they were criticizing, they were, they were trying to show the limitations of knowledge. And that the uh, tendency of philosophers at different times, both in India and in the modern uh, West that studied Buddhism, I think are totally misled if they try to um, make that a um, make the Buddhists understand the the Buddhists uh, the Buddha's uh, observations about the nature of knowledge as applying somehow to this transcendental state, and I I I don't think that uh, it was the intention of the Buddha to disavow uh, an, an absolute. What he was disavowing is that anything in the relative is not the absolute. In other words, you know, the, the chair is not the absolute, the table is not the absolute, the desk is not the absolute, this body is not the absolute. Even if I consider myself as, as uh, some kind of abstract uh, thought process, that is also, you know, that kind of active consciousness is also not the absolute. Nothing you can point to as an object has uh, an essential nature. And that's what this anatmavada was. But uh, I don't think it was the Buddha's intention to, to when saying in this anatmavada, to deny uh, absolute existence altogether. Thank you very much. I think, I don't know if anyone else is, is here anymore. Yeah, there's still several people here and they haven't cut us off from this Zoom meeting with multiple participants. That's good. <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? You may change your mind, like you may come to the center, maybe. I'm sorry, change what? The screen. The... Oh, is my screen, screen is still blocked out? Yeah, um, I mean, you're visible, but uh, your slides are there on the screen. Oh, uh, I have to stop presenting then. Let's see, how do I stop share? Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Peter, if you look at the chat, there is one question. Oh. And if you can't look at the chat, I will read it for you. Okay. I, I see um, some chats. Uh, one is... Uh, is this applicable only to free word arrangement as in Sanskrit? Oh, okay. Um, it's not applicable only to free word order. 
uh, the problem the problem is that the methods used by Chomsky, of course, were invented first for English, and they apply very well for English. They apply excellently for English and for French and for you know Western European languages. But uh, one thing that struck me several years ago at a linguistics conference was a, a lecture in which uh, the lecturer, whose name I no longer remember, was claiming that this approach was very successful. It gave a, a B average, about 85% success across the world in understanding the world's languages. Uh, and a study of 17 languages uh, had demonstrated this. And then someone from uh, the University of Colorado, uh, a linguist from the University of Colorado stood up and said, yes, but 15 of your 17 languages are Western European languages. And, and uh, they show a, a very good results with this method, but the two that don't were Turkish and uh, Arabic, which have much freer word order. And for them, the success rate was only 60%. Okay, so, so the phrase structure analysis works pretty well for Western European languages where the word order is more fixed, it's more rigid, but it doesn't work well for, for languages where the word order is freer. And that includes modern Indian languages as well, not just Sanskrit. Hindi, with, I, don't, I don't know other Indian languages, but certainly Hindi deals with many of the same problems. My colleagues at IIIT Hyderabad uh, recognized this, and that's why they were eager to use Pananian approaches. So it's not that the approach works only for free word or languages, but it's that the uh, phrase structure approach works better for fixed word order languages than it does for free word order languages. And this approach would work for all languages. And what we want is an approach that works for all languages because that's going to lead to more uh, universal linguistic knowledge. So, so one, one thing I want to emphasize is that my approach to studying Panini is, is that he's, he's giving us Panini, Panini and the Panini tradition, the Kondapata, is that these are linguistic scientists and they are contributing to knowledge which is uh, universal linguistic knowledge and it's very much relevant and applicable to linguistic science <laughs> so Professor S. K. Chalal asked how how can the realization of ultimate consciousness be helpful in containing COVID-19? Well, my, my response to that is that consciousness is life. Consciousness is the essence of life. And if you expand consciousness and increase consciousness and the pervasion of consciousness in the physiology, it can only but in, increase and promote health. Uh, let's see, another question from uh, Professor Subramanian. How does this relate to Bhartahari's no notion of the power of language to create what does not exist? Uh, well, uh, if language, language is an expression of cognitive structure, and cognitive structure is an expression of consciousness, if consciousness is the fundamental element of the universe, then expressions of, of language are representing fine structures in consciousness, which are also the structures of entities. And so this is very relevant to the whole, what we would call the Vedic philosophy of language, where uh, one considers that that speech is, is the first step in the creation of, of the world in, in cosmogony. So, but anyway, I, I, I w was participant in a conference at the Bandarka about almost a year ago. And uh, so the, the power of language to 
to create is captured in this Bhag Sukta, the uh, 125th Sukta of the 10th Mandala of the Rig Veda, where she says in the last verse that she moves like the wind, speech says she moves like the wind creating all things. Anybody else have a question, comment? Well, if not, I suppose we can close there. Uh, I've spoken enough. <laughs> okay, thank you all. And if you have any additional comments, oh, I had another question came in. Uh, is the binary of speech and writing present in Panini? Uh, Panini focuses mainly on, on oral expression of speech. Uh, he mentions Lippi, it's mentioned in the Ashtadhyayi, but uh, I think the dominant mode of, of knowledge communication at that time was, was verbal rather than in writing. And so he, he doesn't focus on uh, a distinction All right, if, you, if any of you have additional comments or suggestions, please uh, email me, uh, sharp at sanskritlibrary.org. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is my website, Sanskrit Library. And you can find me and my publications uh, under personnel if you go to personnel and directors, you'll find my name and my curriculum vitae with my publications listed if you are interested in seeing them. Otherwise, thank you very much. And let's close here. Thank you, Rita. Thank you all.